how do we fly? This question has baffled humans so much that we've always been envious of birds for their ability to fly. Inspired from them, Leonardo da Vinci came up with a theoretical design of a flying machine which he called the Ornithopter. Since then, it took us four centuries before the first successful flight by Wright brothers in 1907. In this lesson, we will learn the how of flying. The difference in pressure distribution between the top and bottom surfaces of an airplane wing is responsible for generating the necessary upward or downward force during takeoff or landing. This force, which is perpendicular to the free stream motion of the fluid, is called the lift force. Depending on the engineering application, this force can be either beneficial or detrimental. In case of an aircraft wing, this force is responsible for lifting the aircraft from the ground. This is, however, something you completely want to avoid if you are a Formula One driver or a NASCAR driver. In such cases, engineers have designed spoilers, vanes, diffusers to provide sufficient downforce which acts in the direction opposite to the lift force and maintains the car grounded at high speeds. In fact, a spoiler gets its name as it spoils this unfavorable lift force on cars. While we have seen how lift force considerations are central to a number of engineering applications, the same force plays a key role in sports. A cricket ball generating a reverse swing, the curve ball in baseball where the direction of rotation produces either a floater or a sinker, and the famous free kick by Roberto Carlos in football are such few examples. Several parameters govern the magnitude and direction of this lift force, including the shape of the object under consideration, its orientation with respect to the free stream flow, dimensionless numbers such as Reynolds number and Mach number, and the surface roughness of the object. In aerodynamics, the orientation of a moving object in a fluid is generally called the angle of attack. This angle can be positive or negative and is fixed depending on our need for either an upward force or a downward force. A flat plate with a positive angle of attack can generate lift. However, it would be a poor choice given the flow separation near the trailing edge. Airfoils, which are more streamlined than flat plates, are typically used to generate lift in airplanes. In the case of airfoils, the angle of attack is formally defined as the angle between the direction of upstream flow and the cord of an airfoil. An airfoil can be symmetric or non-symmetric. Symmetric airfoils cannot generate any lift with zero angle of attack because the pressure forces on the top side and bottom side balance. A non-symmetric airfoil, on the other hand, can generate a lift force with zero angle of attack due to the non-uniform force distribution on both sides. These non-symmetric airfoils are commonly referred to as cambered airfoils. The flow impinging on the leading edge of a wing is abruptly brought to rest and this is called the stagnation point. Because the velocity of the fluid is zero at this point, the pressure here is the highest. The free stream air is split into two portions by the leading edge of the wing. The shape of the airfoil or its angle of attack forces a larger volume of air at the bottom compared to the top. This causes a higher pressure at the bottom 
which eventually leads to an upward lift force. This is the key physical mechanism of a flight. A lift force is primarily a resultant of normal pressure forces acted upon by the fluid on the object. Tangential viscous shear forces contribute very little to this. Therefore, inviscid theory is quite capable of predicting lift. Historically, before we had the computational methods and the computing resources that are available today, physicists and mathematicians were able to design airfoils to generate larger lift force using the inviscid theory of line bodies such as thin airfoils. One such early method was the kutta jakowski theorem, which was developed separately by Martin Kutta and Nikolai Jakowski from the famous Bernoulli's theorem. They assumed the velocities at the top and bottom of a thin airfoil to be equal to the free stream velocity and defined a relationship between the lift force and circulation. This theorem was later used to develop other methods such as the lattice vortex methods. In these methods, the lifting surface is approximated as a series of vortex panels and is applicable for ideal flows such as potential flows. Applying the potential field theory, the velocities at each point can be obtained by adding contributions from each of these vortex panels. We apply a Dirichlet boundary condition with zero normal velocity across the surface to convert this into a system of linear equations to solve for circulation. The final resultant force is obtained by applying the kutta jakowski theorem for each individual panel and these forces are summed up together to obtain the total lift. The results obtained by these theories matched the experimental tests conducted in a wind tunnel facility primarily by the National Advisory Committee of Aeronautics, NACA in short. The results from these experiments are still used for benchmarking and validation of computational predictions. In fact, most airfoils follow the NACA naming convention where the shape is prescribed by four numbers. The lift force generated by an airfoil is proportional to the angle of attack, especially for small angles. The lift coefficient increases with this angle. For the NACA 0012, beyond an angle of 10 degrees, the airfoil reaches a critical value after which the generated lift force suddenly plummets. This is called wing stall and is primarily caused by flow separation occurring on the upper surface of the airfoil. Not only does the lift force decrease due to the onset of large wake, but at this point, the drag force increases as well. An aircraft pilot needs to be well aware of this and maintains control on the angle. For an efficient airfoil design, it is not enough to increase the lift. An aircraft designer has to worry about drag, which is caused by both pressure and viscous forces. The ratio of lift to drag is used to determine the aerodynamic efficiency of an airfoil. The objectives here is to generate higher lift to drag ratios. This is a plot of CD versus CL for the NACA 0012 airfoil. The CL of a high-performing wing is two orders of magnitude larger than the corresponding CD. Under steady flight conditions, the lift force generated by an aircraft must be equal to its weight. Therefore, for a given weight, we need to maximize CL to maintain a minimum flight speed. Lower flight speeds are necessary for low power consumption. 
thereby improving the fuel efficiency of an aircraft. This is accomplished by employing high lift devices such as slats and flaps in large commercial aircrafts. Slats are aerodynamic structures fitted on the leading edge of an aircraft. The secondary flow between a slat and the airfoil reduces the adverse pressure gradient experienced on the top surface, thereby delaying the flow separation. This allows aircrafts to operate at larger angle of attack. Flaps, on the other hand, are movable accessories fitted to the trailing edge of the wing and are extended during flight takeoff and landing. These are typically hinged to a trailing edge and their angles can be controlled independently. An aircraft can have more than one flap and this configuration is called a multi-element trailing edge flap. When a flap is deflected downward, it increases the camber of the airfoil. This leads to the generation of a larger lift and the same angle of attack. In addition, this lift coefficient is generally higher than a regular airfoil. Flights deploy flaps at lower speeds to generate the same lift. Slats and flaps are also used to increase the drag experienced by the aircraft. And this is an advantage especially while landing large commercial aircrafts. Depending on the flight phase, we can have three different configurations, takeoff, cruise, and landing. During takeoff, both slat and flaps of the aircraft are partially deployed. In the cruise mode, no high lift devices are used. In the landing mode, the slat and flap of the aircraft are fully extended, which results in an increased drag. So the next time you fly, make sure you're seated to get a good view of the wing and you will know exactly what the pilot is intending to do by just looking at the wing.